Good evening. Everybody doing all right? That's good. That's good. Let me move this over a little bit so I can see you guys. It's good to be here. Just have the opportunity to to share with you. Uh, uh, Rick invited me. Y'all know that guy. Uh, Pretty funny guy. He just asked me if I believed in free speech. I said, yes. He said, good, come give one. So... (laughs) So, no, I'm excited uh, to be here and just to have the opportunity to share with you uh, from God's word and my experience and all of those different things. I do want to make sure one thing, though. Where's the guy that got the helmet? The helmet? Are are you a Cowboys fan? (laughs) That was a a slow, I want to make sure he doesn't take it and destroy it. Uh, If he was a Redskins fan, we might have done some damage to that helmet, so, right? Okay, so we're good there. We're good, at least for now. But that's good. Um, I want to thank you guys for having me here. It's been a blessing just to be able to talk to some of you outside and just have the opportunity uh, to to share with you and uh, and just be around this atmosphere. This is a great atmosphere when you can get men together around God's word. Uh, If we can get more men to stand up and become the men God has called them to be, that would be great uh, for the kingdom of God. Um, And so I'm excited. I got to say a big thanks to my wife for allowing me to be here. Uh, we have four kids all under eight. And so, exactly. So if I'm here with you, that means uh, she's, she's carrying the load uh, at home. And so thanks to her. Uh, my daughter's name is Kelsey. She's eight. I got a son named Jonathan the second. We call him J2 just to throw a little swag on it. He's six. And then uh, we have uh, Camden, who's three, and then Kyler, uh, who's one. So we're definitely in the middle of the woods with no navigation, uh, just trying to figure out how to get all these things done. He said that, he mentioned that I'm the chaplain for the Dallas Cowboys and have been. This will be my sixth year doing that. And God has used my... Thank you. I know some, some of you are probably thinking, well, you need to do a better job, buddy. That's what you need to do. <laughs> but we're working, somebody's clapping, yeah, this. <laughs> but we're working, we're working hard on that. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a hard deal, and being in that atmosphere as a player, uh, you realize that these guys 20 years old with $15 million in their bank account, I mean, it's like they're just getting handed sin. You know, it's, it's basically what it is. You give a 20-year-old who's never had a dad and nobody's taught him anything about money and all of those different things, you just hand him $15 million. We start from a different place in discipleship. Uh, getting him to prioritize, and them, whoever it is, uh, to prioritize God's word over all that that they've just been handed from the world. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a great opportunity Uh, to do that. And it's amazing how God will use your experiences to take you to the place where he wants you to be, where he, where you can do ministry on his behalf. And so I'm happy just to be able to do that. But before we get started, I always start with a word of prayer and then we'll just jump right in. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for our time. Thank you for Man Church, where we are the church. Help us to be that in our communities, Lord, and help the men in this room um, to not just read about it, not just learn about it, not just talk about it, but to walk it out. Because the question that we ask in today's culture are, where are the men? We love you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's ask that question. Where are the men? Right here. (laughs) Because these days, it seems like we're not around. I mean, we're around. We're just not around. Because most men choose to be more like the abominable snowman, footprints everywhere but nowhere to be found. We live in a generation of boys that are being raised to be men just like their mothers. Because 70% of us in the African American community, we don't even have fathers. And 40% rising in the Anglo community don't even have fathers. So I'm just saying we're around, we're just not around spending all of our time right in the middle of a decaying culture that we ourselves have bound. Women, they're forced to be mothers, fathers, leaders, protectors, nurturers, providers. They're pretty much doing it all, in some sense, operating all outside of their created being. And then you and I, we want to take them to the counselor and tell the counselor that she won't submit. Submit? Submit to what? 
submit to a man who himself will not submit? Well, that would automatically create friction. And besides, it's an inherent contradiction. Jesus' whole life was about submitting to the will of his Father. So if we're supposed to be men who are following Christ, we ought to submit as he did. So that our kids can watch us submit to the Father. So the problems you feel you may have with your wife, the next man won't experience with your daughters. Girls, some, have a twisted view of love these days. I've literally seen some girls date the devil just to experience a man. While boys think their manhood is wrapped into how many women they can sleep with, just like their Rolling Stone daddies, and handling their problems with a gun in their hand, and it's all because of the absence of a man. Oh, we're around. I'm just saying we're not around. Just look around. Our culture is suffering because of the man's unwillingness to suffer. But when I look at Christ, I see that he suffered, especially when he hung on the cross. So it seems to me that suffering is the job description given to man from the boss. Suffer. Yeah, that requires that you and I be a little bit tougher. And I'm not talking about just staying at work later and chasing harder after shiny things and dreams. You know how men do. Even though I do realize that we all have to provide, I'm talking about suffering and Christ sufferings because that's the only thing that's gonna keep your legacy in mind. Like when my granddad died, and he was there laying on his death cot, his kids and his kids' kids weren't standing around talking about the things that he bought. I think not. It was more like when my sister Crystal ran over to him and said, Grandpa, Grandpa, your great-grandkids are running around going crazy as if this is a day to celebrate. Do you want me to quiet the boys? Grandpa said, no, no, Crystal, you don't understand. This is a day to celebrate because I wanted to die to this noise. And then it happened. He fell asleep right there in the middle of his own den. But I can still see the pride in his face because he was surrounded by all his kingdom men that came from him. Yeah, we prayed with him. And we also thanked him for not letting anything in his life be a deterrent. Because now that allows his legacy the opportunity one day to hear what he heard that day. Well done, my good and faithful servant. But I got another granddad. We call him Two Daddy. He's in Baltimore, he still lives. And some of you may know a little bit about his story because that's how my dad, Tony Evans, is who he is. First generation Christian. Don't think the Evans family has always been saved, you'd be amazed. From high school dropouts to drugs and poverty, that was our legacy back in the days. But Two Daddy found that word, he ran into Christ and then he got saved. And he held that thing close and never fumbled it, even though his wife took him through an emotional maze. And if she was still here, she'd tell you, it lasted about 365 days. He suffered a lot as well. But around about day 367, she even came downstairs with tears in her eyes because the spirit put her under a spell. And I'm not talking abracadabra. This was a courageous investment of my two daddy's time. And now that one year of suffering has become a 50-year harvest that I can call mine. And my wife, and my daughter, and my son, and my son, and my daughter we call sweet one. And it's our job to hold that legacy tight until Jesus comes and says that it's done. But enough about me, what about you? What has your legacy become? And if your legacy hasn't started yet, then I dare you to be the first one. But that's enough. As far as this poem is concerned, I've said what I need to say. Besides, my prayer is simple, that the men at Shades Mountain will become kingdom men if not already and start building your legacies today because that will be your greatness. Today I want to talk to you about the pursuit of greatness. I remember when I was with the 2006 San Diego Chargers playing in the NFL and I went into training camp And training camp, this was 2006 prior to the rules, so training camp was a beast. We were playing real football in 2006. (laughs) Now you gotta, you know, you can't wear pads, but this many days, you can only have this many practices. Now they're, you know, they're doing uh, volleyball or something. We were playing real football. I get on the guys all the time about that. 
But I remember getting up at 6 a.m., not getting back to your room till 9 p.m., two, sometimes three practices if he wanted to insert a special teams practice, full pads every single day. He didn't care about your existence. We were trying to get something done in training camp in 2006. It was rough. By day four, we didn't even know what day it was because every practice you think is a new day. Nope, it's the same day. If you see a light at the end of the tunnel, it's not a light. If it is a light, it's just the light of an oncoming train. You didn't feel like you were ever going to get through this thing. The veterans by day five were talking about this was the year that they were going to hang it up. The rookies were calling their mom saying, get everything ready. I'm not going to make it. We were feeling ourselves whining, grumbling, groaning, and complaining, just trying to make it through this monster that we call training camp. And I remember day seven like it was yesterday because it was terrible. Guys were feeling themselves, didn't want to come to practice. Guys were bandaged up, just trying to make it through this monster called training camp. And I remember that practice. Phillip Rivers was throwing interceptions. LaDainian Tomlinson had two fumbles. Lights out Sean Merriman wasn't hitting anybody, which was very rare for him. And I looked at the head coach, and I saw that he had taken notice, but he didn't say a word. He just rubbed his chin. I said, okay, great. Well, we got away with one. We can do this every day. Let's just get this over with. Too bad on day seven, we still had four more weeks to go. We were just getting started. I thought we kind of got away with it. That is until we got to the team meeting room at 7 a.m. the next morning. We're whining, grumbling, groaning, and complaining. I'm slouched down in my seat, eyes half shut, just trying to make it. I'm sitting next to LT. LT is sitting next to Darren Sproles. Darren Sproles is sitting next to Michael Turner. We're just got a great group of guys who aren't acting great at all because we're feeling ourselves based on our circumstances. And you can hear the noise through the room, and then finally the head coach enters the room, and all goes quiet, shh, because the elephant has just entered the room. He goes by the name of Marty Schottenheimer, a Bill Parcells error coach, a tough guy. And we knew today was different because he always would do a team speech before we kind of went out to practice but we knew it was different because this day he just paced and he looked for about five minutes, no talking at all. Five minutes of no talking seems like an eternity. And he looked at each individual player right between the eyes, almost as if to see what we were thinking. So I sat up in my seat because I didn't know what was about to happen. And finally, he began to speak. He said, men, I did not just cast a net in hopes that the great players that I needed to win a Super Bowl right here with the 2006 San Diego Chargers would just so happen to fall into it. He said, that's not the way I work. You've been hand-selected, cherry-picked, and chosen by none other than myself, and I'm Marty Schottenheimer. I don't make mistakes with who I choose. I watched your film beforehand. I know exactly what you can do and how you can contribute to the team, which is the reason why you're sitting in this seat, because you've been called. I have a playbook that I know works. It's been tried and tested over the years of my career. I've given you a coach and staff that I know can coach you up. I've given you the facilities that you need in order to meet, in order to do the things that you've been called to do based on the book. And most importantly, I've given you a uniform with your name on it. But you got to do something for me. I can give you all that, a book, facilities, uniform, all of those different things. But if you don't maintain the integrity of the uniform that you've been given, you will nullify the promise that I'm making. I'm giving you a promise that we can be great right here with the 2006 San Diego Chargers. But if you don't believe it in your feet, then we won't experience it on the field. So stop whining, grumbling, groaning, and complaining. Stand up, strap on your pads, put on your helmet, and meet me at the 50-yard line because the time for your greatness will start right now. I'm kind of feeling that right now. <laughs> and that's the paraphrase version. Few words I can't use. But I remember that crystal clear like it was yesterday. And then I retired from the Washington Redskins in 2009, and I didn't know what I was doing with my life. I knew what my dad was doing. I knew what Priscilla was doing. I knew what Anthony was doing. I knew what, all, I knew what they were doing. But what God, I felt forgotten. I was just lost. I was in no man's land just trying to figure this thing out. And so I prayed about it, and God knocked on the door of my heart, and he said, you remember that speech Marty gave you back in 2006? I said, sure. He said, haven't I said the same thing to you? 
In Romans 8, 29, he says that those that he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. That those that he predestined, he called. That those that he called, he justified. That those that he justified, he glorified. So what then can you say, Jonathan, if I'm for you, then who in the world can be against you? And at that moment, that's when I realized that I have been called and you have been called and your sons have been called and your wives have been called and your daughters have been called to nothing less than greatness in the kingdom of God. And the last time I checked, he's God. He doesn't make mistakes with who he chooses. That means if you're sitting in this seat, he saw your game tape beforehand and put you here for a specific purpose and a specific reason. You say, well, Jonathan, why am I not experiencing that on the field then? Well, maybe you're not maintaining the integrity of the uniform you've been given. It's time for men to move from passivity on the bench to getting in the game and making plays. We're looking at God and God is saying, I'm looking at you. There's a man who was called to greatness that I want to touch on just three verses today. Genesis chapter 12. If you've got your phones or your Bible, you can turn there just for a second. Because I want you to see this just for our little study today. Because we all have been called for greatness. And here's a formula for it. Genesis chapter 12, 1, 2, and 3. These are three of my favorite verses in the Bible because they say a lot. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go forth from your country and from your father's house and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's a monster blessing. That's a monster promise. Let me, let me just say it again so you can see how the Bible preaches itself. Hey, Abraham, my word is coming to you, and I want you to leave your country, your relatives, your father's house, and go to the land which I will show you. And then when you get there, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make you a great name. Matter of fact, I'm going to bless you. Matter of fact, even beyond that, I'm going to bless those who bless you, and I'm going to curse those who curse you. I'm going to have your back 100%. You're going to be a blessing, and in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth will experience a blessing. That's some good stuff. Is there a man amongst me right now that wants to be blessed? If you don't raise your hand, you're not telling the truth. That God was going to bring a great promise to the man Abraham. But notice, when God's word came to Abraham, Abraham was already settled in Haran. In chapter 11, verse 31 and 32, you'll see that Abraham's family had already settled in Haran. To settle means to drop anchor. Settle means I'm not going anywhere else. Settle means I'm good in my career. I'm good in my family life. I'm settled in how I do things. This is how I roll. And I don't plan on advancing or going any further. That's what settle means. The word there is not camped. Camped means I'm on a journey. I stop for a minute and keep going. He's saying I have settled. I'm done. And then the word of the Lord comes to Abraham and says, I want you to get unsettled from the place where you've settled and go. Let me tell you something about the voice of God. When the voice of God comes to you, it unsettles those who are settled. God's voice is not a settling voice. Some of us ask the question, well, what's that voice I hear in my head that's telling me what I already want to do anyway? That's your voice. That's why it sounds like you. It's that same voice that's not saying something nice when someone cuts you off on the freeway. It's that voice. But when God speaks, he says in Isaiah 55, as high as the heavens are above the earth are my ways from your ways and my thoughts from your thoughts. I'm not thinking what you're thinking. Matter of fact, my plans for you and your plans for you are not located in the same location. He was telling Abraham to go somewhere totally different than where Abraham had settled. So he gave Abraham an unsettling word. You know when God is talking, when you're trying to not think about that thing anymore or that thing doesn't make sense. And for years, you've been trying to get away from that thought but because it's an unsettling thought, but you can't find your way away from it. That's because God is talking. You're trying to move away from, there's no way I'm doing that. That doesn't make sense. I already make more at the job that I have. Why would I take this job? Why would I go to ministry when I'm doing so well? But why can I not stop thinking about it the last three years of my, my life? Because God is talking. 
And when God speaks, he unsettles those who are settled. Abraham, I need you to go to a land that you've never seen before. Noah, I need you to build an ark even though you're not well acquainted with rain. Sarah, you're going to have a baby at 90. David, you're a shepherd boy, you're 16, but go kill Goliath and be a 40-year reigning king over Israel. It doesn't make sense. That's because God is talking. And there's some men in this room that are thinking about some circumstances in your life where God is calling you to something and it doesn't make sense, but it's unsettling. You can't figure out why you can't shake it. Let me help you understand now. It's because God is talking and it's an unsettling voice. He told Abraham, I need you to go. I need you to be uncomfortable for my word. Leave your relatives, your country, and your father's house? What was he telling Abraham to do before he gives him this promise of greatness? He's telling him to leave everything he knows behind. Leave your will, your way, your perspective, your history, what you thought, how you were raised, that conflicts with God's word, all of those different things that you thought were right that aren't right. I need you to leave it if you want to experience the confetti of greatness that I'm holding in my hands. In Bible study methods, you can't jump to the promise before you get to the go. You can't use God's word out of order and expect God to show up. The promise comes after you get uncomfortable. And you say, well, I'm I'm just waiting on God to show up and show out. God is waiting on you to show up and show out. And at the point in which you move, he'll move and it'll be just like that. In our church, we install motion detector lighting. The reason why we install motion detector lighting is because People who don't pay bills don't turn off lights. So (laughs) as the church was getting bigger, we had to figure out how to save money on our electric bill because things just weren't weren't working out in that area. So this is back in the day, obviously, because it's been out for a long time. But it works. You know how it works when there's movement in the room. Bing. When there's no movement in the room, boom. The low voices means it turns off. So it's simple. The power is in the room, but the experience of the power is totally dependent upon the movement on the ground. If there's no movement on the ground, the power is there, but the experience of the power is not there. And for a lot of men, God is an ethereal spirit in Never Never Land who you never get to experience his power in your life. And you're saying, why won't he move? And he's saying, why won't you move? Because at the moment that you move, I'll move. That he's telling Abraham, before we get to the good stuff, before we get to the promise, before we get to the greatness, before we get to the confetti, I want to see if you're going to move from the place where you're comfortable and if you're willing to get uncomfortable based on my word. And when you move, then we can get to the good stuff. God has greatness for men in these rooms, but he's waiting for you to get uncomfortable in what he's calling you to do. We've become comfortable in church. Um, I can get around my boys, I can sit down, we speak the same language, Christianese, we're, you know, talking the same, we got things going on, we kind of have the same things going, we kind of feel. In Matthew chapter 5, he says that we are the salt of the earth. He does not say that we are the salt of the shaker. Salt, the purpose of salt in the Bible was to be a preservative for the meat. They didn't have refrigerators. So they would salt coat the meat so that the meat would be preserved by the salt. So if the meat is decaying, it's not the fault of the meat. If the meat is decaying, it's the fault of the salt. And as men, we'll sit and we'll say, okay, well, uh, the, the culture is terrible, and man, can you believe this? And we're shaking our heads. And God is saying... Um, excuse me, sir. If the salt stays in the shaker, you can expect the meat to decay. He's waiting for men to stand up and move as disciples of Jesus Christ. This is what he's called us to. And he's pushing us out of our comfort zone. It's comfortable in here, but the question is, after the huddle is broken, can we now score? 70,000 people don't come to, well, now it's 100,000 now that we built that new stadium. We've got 100,000 people don't show up to a Dallas Cowboy football game to watch 11 men bend over and huddle. They're not paying Jerry Jones prices for that. They don't come to watch 11 men have a private conversation. They pay their money because they want to know what difference the huddle makes. They want to know having now huddled, can you now score? 
They want to know, what are you going to do about 11 men on the other side of the ball that are daring you to go public with that private conversation? (laughs) That's what it's about. It's not about the comfort of the huddle. It's about the uncomfortable place of the line of scrimmage. And that's what God has called us to. Before you can experience the touchdown, before you can experience the throw, before you can experience the big catch, everything that God wants to do in your life, the route design that he has for you, for the perfect positioning for you, where he's called you to be, before you can experience all that, you got to be willing to get uncomfortable. And he tells Abraham, I need you to go. I, uh, go was the transitional word. If you're looking at verse 1, you see go there. He went from staying, settled, to going somewhere else. So that means my transitional term is go. That's the word I had to look at. So being a seminary graduate in 2015, you know, we make sure we study uh, all the laws of words to try to make sure we preach them right and don't preach them wrong and all of those different things. So I spent some time on go. Me and my father both, we spent some time on the word go. We studied it in Hebrew, Greek, Assyriac, Latin, Spanish. We wanted to make sure we had this thing right. And after studying for days and hours, we figured out that it means go. It, mean, it literally renders, don't stay where you are. <laughs> that tells me something simple. It's not a hard word to interpret. And if that's the case, then why do we as men act like it's a hard word to interpret? You didn't just hear me say go? Matter of fact, you've been hearing me say go for like five years. Go where, Jonathan? What are you saying? Well, maybe it's back in correct relationship with your wife that you've been satisfied living separately in the same house. You've been satisfied raising your kids separately. You've been satisfied in distant relationship with your children and your son because of how they're doing and how they're operating and because people don't seem like they're on your side and people don't seem like they're supporting your vision. And there's all of these different reasons and justifications that you've given yourself to be satisfied in the comfortable place, even if it's not God's best. But you've also been hearing in the quiet of your heart You know you need to get that right, don't you? And you've also been going to these Bible studies here at Shades Mountain, and it keeps coming up in the reiterations of God's word, which is called a rhema word, when you keep hearing the same thing from different people who don't know each other. (laughs) It's a rhema word. That means God is talking. That's also how the Bible was written. 40 different authors, 1,600 years, three different continents, all telling one story. God's word. God is talking. That's why you can't shake it. And he's saying, go. It's not a hard word to interpret. For my young guys in here, we know we shouldn't be doing that. We know we shouldn't be with her like that. We, we, we kind of got that. And you know it. You keep hearing the reiterations from different people. But for some reason, we're acting like it's a hard word to interpret. Well, we know we're not married yet, but it's just real comfortable for us to live in the same house and do the same thing. All of our stuff is already connected, so I don't want to kind of break that mold because I've already gotten comfortable there. And even though it's an easy environment for sin to fester and take place, I'm, I'm comfortable where I am, and I don't want to do too much. I might frustrate her. Ah. Go. Because the longer you stay you're pushing back from the table on your own greatness. See, it's like my son sometimes doesn't realize when I'm trying to get him to do something, I already know where I'm taking him. But all he sees is Mario Kart. (laughs) Hold on, Dad, I can't. No, son, we're going to go somewhere. We got somewhere to go as a family. No, I don't want to do that. I'm playing Mario Kart. I'm I'm playing Mario Kart. Okay. You play Mario Kart. 10 o'clock at night, four hours later. So what were you talking about earlier? You're taking me, where were we going to go? Oh, I was just going to take you to Chuck E. Cheese. (laughs) Uh, But I want to go to Chuck E. Cheese. There's a whole bunch of Mario at Chuck E. Cheese. I knew something you didn't know. But you were comfortable where you were. So you didn't get to experience what I had in my head. And 
And we're grown men. And we've settled for Mario Kart. When God has got a spiritual Chuck E. Cheese waiting. <laughs> My son would be dying right now. Because <laughs> the promise hadn't come yet. The hard part uh, came first. So let me let you think about this for a second because I had to think about it in my own life. What is the thing for years, months, decades where you know the spirit has been prodding you to go and you just haven't? And everybody has their own individual thought rolling through their mind because it's a feeling that you get from the spirit when he's saying go. Ah, come on now. And at the point in which you move, I have something for you. Go to the land which I will show. Remember, Bible study methods, you have to keep words in their order. Go comes before the word show. So if you want God to show, first you must go. Don't expect God to show you if you're not going to go. It's simple Bible study methods. We want God to show, but we don't want to go. We want to know, is the other side, the grass on the other side of the fence as green as what I'm currently standing on? You show me that and I'm ready to do your will. No. Go. This is a tough deal. I sat with my dad uh, when I was in the 12th grade and I did a little poem um, about my story and y'all heard some of it. But in the 12th grade, I wanted to know how he got from his point A to his point B. I had to figure that out because as you heard, my dad is from the inner city of Baltimore, Maryland, where the word statistic derives its meaning. We would go visit my grandparents. We couldn't even go outside. My granddad would put his arm around me. We call him two daddy. And he said, you see those rope dopes across the street? He called them rope dopes the drug dealers that were across the street. And he said, you see what they're doing? He would teach me what they were doing. And then you see where they're going. The cops would pick them up, take them to jail. So he was trying to teach me based on the environment that we were in, that you didn't want to end up like that. Cause he was trying to get that, the, the statistic, uh, frame of reference out of our minds at a young age. And I said, Dad, you raised by high school dropouts. You ate herring every night for dinner. If you don't know what herring is, it's the fish that has a million bones in it that you have to pick through to eat. His dad was a longshoreman, so he just brought home herring every night because they didn't have any money. So if you ever see my dad and you take him out to dinner, don't give him no fish. <laughs> He's going to look at you funny. He don't want no fish. Keep it off the table. to being the first to graduate in our family's history from high school, to go to college and get his degree, to get his master's degree, and then become the first African-American to ever graduate with a PhD from Dallas Theological Seminary. He kept hearing this go, starting a church with 10 people in a house that has 12,000 members, started a radio broadcast so the gospel can get as far as it can go. Now it's in 130 countries and over 1,000 stations was the chaplain of the Mavericks since their conception as, the or, as an organization, the chaplain of the Cowboys in the Tom Landry days. And I'm sitting there in the 12th grade thinking, how in the world did you get from over there to over there? He said, do you really want to know? I said, yeah, I'm sitting here talking to you, aren't I? Yeah, I really want to know. He said, well, go read Hebrews chapter 11 and tell me what you see. I was like, what is this, an Easter egg hunt? You're sitting right here. Can you just tell me? No, son, you know how I work. Go read Hebrews chapter 11 and tell me what you see. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Verse 4. By faith, Enoch, uh, by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain. Verse 5. By faith, Enoch was caught up. Verse 7. By faith, Noah built an ark. Verse 8. Abraham obeyed even though he had no idea where he was going. Verse 11. By faith, Sarah conceived even though she was barren. Verse 22. Isaac blessed Jacob. Verse 24. Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 31, Rahab hid the spies. I closed the book. I said, Dad, I know how you did it. He said, how'd I do it? I said, you did it by faith. Bingo, boy. I said, okay, I got that. I found the egg. But tell me, what does that mean? I'm going to give you the famous Tony Evansism on faith. Faith is acting like it is so even when it's not so, so that it might be so, simply because God said so. 
Faith is acting like it is so, even when it's not so, so that it might be so, simply because God said so. I said, so dad, what are you telling me? This whole, this Abraham idea that we're talking about, that he didn't get to see where he was going but had to be obedient. I said, dad, what are you telling me? You telling me to follow your heart? He said, are you kidding me, son? Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is the most deceitful part of you and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I said, well, what are you telling me? He said, I'm not telling you to follow your heart. I'm telling you to make your heart follow the truth. That's right. And at the point in which you do that is at the point you'll be walking in the direction for your own greatness. Faith. Are we willing to have faith to leave the comfortable place because we know God's word has been prodding us for years? And until we as men move, no matter what age you are, there's something, there's some go then he holds a tight grip of what he wants to give us. God holds on to his promises even if you're not the one that gets to experience it. The people of Israel will tell you as they were going to the promised land. They didn't get it, but the generation after them did. God is faithful, but if you're not faithful, then you won't get to experience it while he still maintains his righteous faithfulness to somebody else. I don't know about you, but in this one life I live, I want to know what God has for me. This one shot that we get as men, I want to know why he selected us and put us in this seat. He said, Abraham, I need you to leave your will, your way, your perspective, your father's house, your relatives, the place where you dropped anchor, pull it back up and go to the land which I will show you. Watch this. Here comes the good stuff. Now that we've slapped the dough around and made it ready, we can put pepperoni and sausage on top. And I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a great name. I'm going to have your back no matter what. I got you. And in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed if you're willing to go. But let's understand greatness. He said, I'll give you a great nation prior to saying I'll give you a great name. God is not in the business of just making the name on the back of your jersey as big as possible for no reason. He told Abraham in Genesis 18, 19, if you lead your children and your household in righteousness and justice, then I will bring about the promise that I made to you in Genesis chapter 12. This isn't just about you, Abraham. It's about the whole nation of Israel through you, Abraham. The question is, what impact do we have as men under those that are under the sphere of our influence? And if there's no impact, there's no greatness. We're chasing greatness the wrong way. The American definition of greatness is how much I can do, how big my house is, what I drive, me, 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 me. We're thinking about the human trinity and not the spiritual trinity, me, myself, and I. And that's our definition of greatness. Real quick, let me tell you a little bit about a false definition of greatness. I was talking to Des Bryant after one of our chapel services, and I said, who used to wear the number you're wearing? He said, Michael Irvin. I said, where is he? He's a Hall of Famer. I said, he is? He said, Jay, come on now. You know he is. I said, okay, I know he is. So he was that great, huh? I said, yeah, he was was good. That's nice. I said, who wears 88 now? He said, I do. What's your point? I said, well, whose name is on the back of that jersey? He said, it's my name. I said, you mean Michael Irvin's name is not on the back of that jersey anymore? (laughs) He said, say, man, I don't know if I like where this is going. (laughs) I said, you mean to tell me no matter how great Michael Irvin was, even enshrined in the Hall of Fame, they just unstitched his name and just put your name on the back of it? It seems to me that no matter how great you are, once people are finished with you, they just say, next. Thanks for your service. Goodbye. I said, so what are you chasing, Des? Are you chasing the very people that will get rid of you right after you're done? Or are you chasing God who's got an everlasting greatness held in his hands? 
One of my most terrifying moments as the chaplain for the Dallas Cowboys was when we had a death on the team about three seasons ago. One of the players died at 3 a.m. in a car accident. The next day, well, it's the same day because it was 3 a.m., we're going to play the Cincinnati Bengals. NFL is not going to not play a game because somebody dies. I'm going up the stairs to get on the plane. Coach Garrett is coming down the stairs. Coach Garrett grabs my arm and pulls me right back down the stairs. I was like, uh, are you going to cut the chaplain? What's happening here? <laughs> I mean, I've been through this before. I know what this feels like. <laughs> and he looked me right in the eyes. And when he looks you in the eyes, he doesn't even blink. And he says, we had a death on the team, him and uh, Brian Wansley. We had a player die last night. Are you kidding me? Nope. We had a player die last night, very unfortunate. He's crying, Brian's, I mean, it's just a mess. He said, well, this is, you know, this is kind of not, we don't really know how to handle this kind of stuff. You're the chaplain, get on the plane and do something. <laughs> this is like my second season. I was like, all right, I'll be there in just a second. Tony Evans, um, I'm gonna need some help in this situation. I'm not really sure. I got on the plane and started hugging guys and praying with guys. And I said, all right, it's up to me. Good. Everybody take a knee. From Jerry Jones all the way to the back of the plane, we're on their knees, head down. Because when mortality sets in, God is the only place you can go. So I prayed over the entire plane. We got to the hotel. Guys came to chapel who never come to chapel. Chapel room packed. I didn't know what I was going to say. I had prepared a message. Message didn't have anything to do with what just happened. So I'm just going in there very nervous. And the Spirit said, what else can you say? It's time for the gospel. They're ripe and ready. So I gave a blanket elementary gospel message, which is all it has to be when the Spirit is working. I didn't have to do any acrobats with the Bible and do all that. Mm -mm. Jesus Christ. Guys got saved who had never even talked to me before. Then we got on the field to play the game. And this is the part that bothered me the most. I'm standing next to Mo Claiborne and DeMarcus Ware. Let's give a moment of silence to Jerry Brown Jr., All right, sing the national anthem, fly the planes over, kick the ball off because everybody came here to see a football game. I looked at D. Ware and I said, so that's what we're living for, a moment of silence? I looked at Mo Claiborne as he's shaking his head. I said, no matter how hard you play, no matter how many interceptions you get, you know what we're going to give you? A moment of silence. Good luck out there. I'm always finding a word for him. I care less about football. But it brought, it brought it all in perspective. Men, no matter what you do, next moment of silence. Thanks. Let me show you what God was offering Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons. And many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so were you. So let's just praise the Lord. Okay, don't lift your hands up. I'm good. <laughs> Won't have to go that far. You mean to tell me after 4,000 years we're still singing about Abraham? You mean to tell me I'm pre preachers all over the world are still preaching about this dude? That's greatness. That's worth fighting for. That's worth living for. That's, what, that's worth going to work for. That's worth staying with your wife for. That's worth raising your kids for. That's worth making disciples for. That's worth it. He told Abraham, as I get ready to close, in you, Abraham, 
all the families of the earth will be blessed. Let me tell you why I like this passage as I close. In you, Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Were all the families of the earth blessed through Isaac? Nope. Were all the families of the earth blessed through Isaac's son, Jacob? (laughs) No. Were all the families of the earth blessed through Jacob's 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel? Nope, they were a mess. But through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, through the 12 sons, the nation of Israel would become a little Israelite king born in Bethlehem, Jesus Christ, who would be a blessing outside of the people of Israel to the Gentiles also, to all the families of the earth. Genesis 12, 1, 2, and 3 is a promise of greatness to a man because that man, through his obedience, would be genealogically connected to Jesus Christ. That without Jesus Christ, there is no greatness. If Jesus Christ is not the connecting point, you're not great. You never can be great. Because Abraham's greatness wasn't about the fact that he's Abraham. Abraham's greatness wasn't about the fact that he was an Old Testament dude. Abraham's greatness was connected to the fact that he was connected to Jesus. You want to be great? You're only going to get that one way. And that's connected to Jesus. You want to be great? Make sure your kids are connected to Jesus. You want to be great? Since Abraham was a rich man, it wasn't just his kids, it was his servants and everybody that he had under the sphere of his influence. God told him to circumcise the men, which means put them under the covering in the covenant. You want to be great? Make sure everybody around you is circumcised, saved. You want to be great? Connect to Jesus. Every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment. I just want to pray with you men tonight about how we're living our lives and the go that we've heard, but that we may not have activated. And I want to start with those who don't know that they know that they know that they know. That if today was your last day, you would stand before God and he would see his son and therefore let you in to his kingdom. If you're not sure that you've ever accepted Jesus Christ, if you're not sure that you've ever been connected to greatness, then I want to give you an opportunity right now with every head bowed and every eyes closed. If you are saved and you know for a fact that you are, you ought to be praying for those that may not be. If you're not sure, I want to say a prayer. It's not the prayer or the words that save you, it's your belief that does. Repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm in need of a savior. I wanna be great for the first time today and be connected to you. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the dead for me. And I'm placing my trust, all of my faith, in your finished work today. Make today my day. And remember me. Because today, I trust you. If everybody just keeps their head bowed, if the leaders can pick their heads up, if you prayed that prayer for the first time and you meant it for yourself and you're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that today was a great day for you, I just want you to slip your hand up in the air. Just slip your hand up in the air. I see you. I see you. We'll give a few more moments. If this is your first time and today you know that greatness is upon you. Now I want to do one other thing. If there's a man in here who knows that they've been hearing the go, but they just haven't went. 
that they want to recommit themselves to the word of God, no matter how uncomfortable it is. I want to pray with you. I just want you to stand. If you need to recommit today to to a go in your life, I want you to stand up and I don't want you to be ashamed because we've all got something. If we can get a couple leaders to surround those guys and pray with those guys. This time is for you, men. And for the men that are still sitting down, I would be very prayerful for these men. You never know what we're going through in this room. You never know what men are facing in this room. Let's just take this moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we honor you today and we thank you for the gentlemen that have accepted Jesus Christ tonight. We know that the heavens are rejoicing. We know that in Luke chapter 15, Jesus is talking about how he has come for the lost and the sinners, not the righteous, but that just one creates a great celebration. And so we, your people, we're celebrating for a new brother in Christ. For those that have recommitted themselves, Lord, we pray that you continue, as we know you will, continue to press that go button in their heart and their soul. But more so that they would listen and that we would listen, that I would listen. That the men here at Shades Mountain would listen and go. Make disciples. No longer being satisfied with being salt that stays in the shaker, but that actually preserves the culture. We love you and honor you today. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, men, for having me. It's been a blessing to be with you guys.